those kind of efforts of commercial. We went to uh, automatic reads, drive-by reads, those things, and, and improving the meter quality that we had, the type that measured down to about five percent of the meters. Some of the meters in the past would, would if you got twenty percent on what was actually flowing, you were lucky. How far along are you on this program? On meter replacement, we're continuing. Uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing basis, and I would say every meter in the city has probably been replaced in the last ten years. All of our large meters have been replaced. Which were the ones where you had to lose loss, and then our residential meters, where in year four of them concentrate from. How long does a meter, what's a meter's life? They can go twenty years, but you start seeing some efficiency loss in about twelve years. That meter, meter loss is normally based on the type of water that you send through. If you send a well water that has some sand, chemical, you know, it's a, it's a, a dropout type chemical sand or, or some kind of lime, if you have a high lime scale system, that life shortens. But uh, you can usually get 10, 20 years out of a good meter. The lime replacement program council did very good. Uh, over the last 10, 15 years in that program, and we've actually reduced the number of major water leaks that we had during the high stress periods or during those summer months because of the, the flow of the demand. And that continuation, that's what we were talking about a while ago, is how to make sure that we keep the revenue stream there so we continue replacement programs. Leak protection, again, those are, we do several different ways of doing that. We have sounding equipment that we can monitor. One of the problems we have here is, is airport traffic and trying to, to read and not locate that information. Public education, talking about, and again, we go back to non-promotional rates, these are, uh, basically tiered rates. We do either continually or through the season, uh, like the April through the uh, October time frame. No discounts, so not giving any credits. We don't do that currently, but that's just one of the things we don't want to give up. Some kind of uh, low end discount. Yes, and I, did I understand you correctly? Leak detection has to do with airport? What happens the noise, is the noise of the airport disrupts their ability to hear. When they use these uh, audio devices to try to detect leaks through the microphones, okay. so that they have trouble hearing them. They're distinguishing them against the noise of the airport. Well, a lot of it is, is if we see the water, we, or we see a leak, and then you go through the water. So on, on the leak tech, what, what tools do we have to force uh, private users to carry a leak on their property? The bill. The bill. The bill is the bill. But if they choose to ignore it. There, we ask them quite politely uh, on the commercial side. There's Ferris and company, and code enforcement, and building enforcement. If they have a fire line that's leaking, for example, it's a non meter product, they will go out and, and basically require them to fix that meter. On the residential side, if you have ponding water or water that's going over sidewalks, you can get involved in the code enforcement standpoint too. Normally, the bills are not to get them right. Well, what about on the commercial for irrigation? Irrigation leaks. Again, if they are, uh, if we're not in any kind of enforcement or stage area, it's mainly a, a request to go fix your leak from, from community development and or public service. There are ordinances uh, related to uh, water on the streets and any freezing. Most of our irrigation systems have uh, freeze protection or freeze guards on it that shut the system down or moisture sensors. Most of the new systems are going. If it's in a private, private drive, private parking lot, <coughs> all you can do really is ask them to fix it. Yeah. We've got <clears throat> the systems installed and permitted. They have to be maintained in proper working conditions. So we have, we have the tool. We ask them, but if they blatantly say no, then the, the systems that are installed have to be installed and maintained. So we have that tool to, to clamp down on them. But most of the time. If we get involved and request them to fix a private system, they do it. Okay. I think this is a palace issue, but I've, I've ceased to be surprised over the years at how many times I see three things going on in the city irrigation. One is broken head geysers. 
second one is tremendous runoff, and the third one is sprinklers running in rain. Bob and I have that continual conversation, and one thing that we are moving toward, we have a centralized control system now on all of our irrigation, so that it registers a increase in flow, it can shut the system down, we're about 90% up on that now, as far as the, the amount of irrigation systems that we have to control. It, it doesn't necessarily stop it with every head blow off. If, if it has a major leak, like a line blowout, not just for a head. And, and the uh, rain gauges, every system we have has a rain gauge on it, but typically it has to collect uh, about an eighth of an inch or greater of rain before they shut off. They're, they're not that sensitive that as soon as it rains, it, it cuts off. We will, we continue to work on our runoff irrigation problems and, and again the type of plantings that we have. Bob and I are, we're, we're all looking at how we will convert what we have in the ground, which is millions of dollars worth of that material. Yeah. <coughs> Converting some of the systems as well because a lot of the runoffs that typically occur in the ground spraying type of irrigation systems. And he's, he's got some that are the drip irrigation types for certain types of landscaping, he's got the, uh, you call it the buried, uh, uh, the root uh, irrigation for trees and things that uh, is designed actually to get under the surface and be most, that's probably the most efficient way of doing it. Um, in some places he's got some challenges because my favorite one that I see often is Valley Parkway at, uh, <laughs> at Bel Air. Uh, he's got real narrow noses on those, those landscape mediums. And uh, to try to control the irrigation within that nose is very difficult to do. Of course, the moral of that story all. is probably ought not to uh, ir or, uh, landscape the noses when they're that narrow. You use some sort of pattern concrete or colored uh, concrete material to decorate it, if you will, and then say your landscape is full of wide areas to be better controlled without running off into the street. But those are some warning experiences that we've had over the last five, six years that I think are changing some of the design characteristics, as well as Steve mentioned, planting different things. Well, let me ask you one other question, and I'm thinking, for example, there was a geyser at the southeast corner of Memorial Park for months, and I called it in several times. Uh, does anybody ever go out and inspect when, you know, a period of inspect? We, every time we get a call, and I, I, I don't know where it was called in, typically we send somebody out right away to do it. In, in some of the areas, even though we try to run through the system, we have to rely on uh, reporting to know where it is. Irrigation runs typically uh, during the late hours when the parks are closed. So it comes on at 11 p.m. and it's off by 6 a.m. and we don't have any crews out there. So the only way to look for these leaks when we don't have it reported, send a crew out and run through each station. Um, and that's very time consuming, but then again, you get back to the water use when you do that. Yep. So, so we try to be very responsive to the reporting. Sometimes a call comes in and it's not very accurate as to the location and, and it may take a couple of calls to determine where it's at. But that, that is one of our areas that we will be addressing more and more as the realization of conservation comes into play. And you have a, you have a recency moving the per gallon per capita from 150 in the old report five years ago to 140. We've, we've got to do a better job of it. And going back on the, the irrigation and medians, there's limitations on what it can do with fields. Uh, at parks because you really got to try to maintain the turf and avoid cracking and spalling of the, the surface and people spraining their ankles and that type of thing. Where council could probably help with this in the future would be when we have a uh, median that's, uh, when we've got some roadway projects in the works right now, when we have a median that we want to uh, landscape in some fashion. We've taken various landscaping plans to the council and 
preference always seems to be for kind of a heavily landscape, kind of uh, frankly water intensive type of approach. Uh, we've shown some variations on that, but there hasn't been a whole lot of support for a more deserty type landscape or sparse approach. Yeah, I know there's, there's occasional local about that. Uh, we looked at Top Hill's, uh, is it uh, Beltline? Yeah, it looks very right. cool. I think it's one that's done primarily with cinder materials and right. some uh, yeah, good rock. decorative rock. Sandy Lake. Sandy Lake. Maybe Sandy Lake. Sandy Lake. Sandy Lake. Sandy Lake. Uh, cactus and things like that. <clears throat> Historically, there's had been a whole lot of excitement about that type of aesthetic versus the other type of aesthetic, which unfortunately is part of my water. So that's just something for the future. So, uh, more strategies coming up to play again. Water saving appliances, fixtures, we talked about that. Rain, uh, rain barrels, we talked about that. We have a few in town. There are several. We have several master gardeners in town, and they are uh, promoting those. Uh, so, reuse program, again, on the residential and commercial. Use of treated effluent. That is one thing that we have in place today. Uh, we sell treated effluent to the Upper Trinity Regional Water District. They, in turn, sell that to Cassidy's as their customer for use of uh, irrigation and uh, Also, treated effluent, uh, a lot of our plant water that we use in uh, the facilities itself, as far as wash down water, cleaning water, those things are used treated effluent instead of using uh, city water. There are other options that you the council has approved as far as along with our master plan and the utility side of doing the reuse program and placing the treated effluent back into Lake Louisville and obtaining credit uh, for that water uh, and reducing the cost of raw water at the purchase. In coordination with uh, Dallas, Regency of Dallas is our supplier, and the contract advises that we have to follow suit when they do uh, any kind of uh, water stage program or water emergency management program. Current status. Again, we were at 176 gallons per capita per day last year. Again, we're in good shape of reaching that goal in the future. Uh, control of irrigation practices is the primary uh, effort that we will be monitoring and working towards, and our citizens will do that as well. And our education programs will be in place. Our emergency water management plan, uh, drought contingency plan, and quick response and action we, uh, in this particular case. This is the short term. This is the immediate need. Uh, Mr. King can, uh, well, actually what would happen is Bassinger, Director of Public Services, would uh, contact us and advise if there is an emergency situation, whether it be on the distribution side of uh, inability to pump the water and keep the water through the system, or drought, or uh, just supply. Something happened with the supply line that we go down. It's a quick response, quick action, quick notification. And those are, the, again, the areas that you see there is A through E that would uh, cause that system to be implemented. Again, our water management plan uh, is continued education of the possibility of activation. It is a quick notice. Uh, basically, it can be issued within the hour. We begin notification to newspapers, through our, our media, uh, Facebook, all of those uh, electronic areas that we have in notification to the public, and just general warning. We also, one time, uh, this has been several years ago, I had both fire and police departments, public service employees, we had a system failure, and each of the departments were out uh, on the street with uh, notification to the public to reduce their water consumption in the summer in an August time frame and we did get through the system uh, through that particular situation uh, very well but it took all of the parts to help us get there. And again regulate the water use through voluntary and mandatory action. Currently we're under stage one which we continue to be in stage one throughout any year and just trying to request that the citizens uh, wash their water needs and uh, water on those 
garbage days that their, their garbage is collected and not on Sunday. Yes, question. Being in Region C, I'm not sure what that encompasses, but if another city in Region C uh, goes to stage three as an example, does that mean that we have to also go to uh, stage three? Is no, sir. One? no, sir. The only, the only group that we're controlling from is the city of Dallas through our contract. If they, if we have to follow the same suit with Dallas because they're our, they're our water supplier. And any other DWU in city, any in DWC. There's 18 cities in the Metroplex that receives water in Dallas. And basically that's a, there are a few cities that are a little bit different on that because Dallas's water consumption is higher. And what they're trying to do in, in their stages is do a 5% reduction on each stage. And we're far below them, so we kind of have some latitude in not moving up to a mandatory stage. When they go to a mandatory stage until a few months later, and I'll get into that in just a few moments. But that basically, we just have to follow Dallas. You have to keep in mind that uh, regionally, there's a lot of different supply sources and a lot of different reasons for a city or a supplier to uh, request customers to go to a different stage of uh, emergency water management. One of the most frequently frequent problems is a disruption of the distribution system. You have a large pipeline that bursts. Uh, a lot of cities will go almost immediately to stage three or four to try to conserve the water until that line gets repaired and they drop back immediately to a lesser stage. Uh, other reasons might be disruptions in supply source, and this is what we're seeing right now out in the North Texas Municipal Utility District cities, which are Plano and Frisco and Allen and so those northeastern and Collin County cities. Uh, they've had difficulty, which you probably have read about, uh, with their supply, which is Lake Le Mans, and then uh, secondarily Lake Texoma, the uh, one of the creek feeders to Lake Levon. Uh, they have had to shut off the flow from Lake Texoma due to the zebra mussel problem. And simultaneously they had the drought and Lake Levon is you've seen pictures of it, what it looks like today. So they're at an advanced stage and thinking about going to another stage of drought management. But that's their system that's affected in that way. We're affected by the drought but not by some of those other issues. So we pretty much follow whatever Remember, their stages are generally in our, are in our emergency water management program, not the conservation side of this presentation. Again, uh, increase from stage one is, is the voluntary. Stage one is voluntary. Stage two, in our system, becomes mandatory. It's all the same items identified in stage one, but those restrictions move from a voluntary restriction to a mandatory. I anticipate Carol and I talked about this many months that in, in Dallas implemented stage one. It's in Dallas, stage one is mandatory on their irrigation system. We anticipate by April, Dallas will recommend that we go to a, our stage two or mandatory. Why doesn't everybody have the same stage? <laughs> that seems logical. Kirby does that. Yeah. There's a problem. Right. 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 Trying to make it logical. Yeah, no, but if. The media is going to say stage one. And so, this was voluntary, the Dallas is mandatory, and I'm sure. What is two for Dallas? Two is more severe mandatory. But Lewis is mandatory, but less of that. The short answer is local control. They, they don't want to uh, impose that. Now, you could certainly, you could, as a council, adopt one that matches Dallas yeah. word for word. That would not be a problem uh, from a management standpoint. I think but there might be some things in there that you might not want to jump to quite as quickly as some other city might want to jump to in terms of some of those mandatory requirements or procedures. And so that's just local control that results in. One thing that yeah. does is that the, they have the lakes to think about, and stage two or three for them is percent depletion of the lake, where we don't deal with that. So our 
Myers is just a manager of matter of control of the usage that we have. And five percent for them would put us into a financial issue if we were to do that. That's right. I'm just talking about yeah. uh, to get consumer buy Because yeah. yeah. right now, when, when if it ever comes out, it, that the numbers don't mean anything from one city to the next. Does that make sense? What, one reason that that we get looked at this about 10 years ago was nobody had a volunteered program. Nobody went out consistently year-round saying you need to do this, you need to do this. I think our citizens are more aware that we've sent out notices, water meals, etc. Water only on the day off. It's voluntary. We say that up front. We feel, you know, and again, this is from staff only, is that it gives us the educational tool that Dallas didn't have. All, they went to stage one, and it was the 13th. So we we're citizens got five. If we were on Dallas' deal, would we be at stage zero? We should have. Yeah. 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 Or something like that. Right. Zero uh, <laughs> and, and also, it is, it's troubling to see NTT, uh, uh, North Texas Municipal stuff, coming out the drought deal and all that But it's primarily, their problem is the muscles. Which, which, uh, it's, it's it's the reservoir levels. Yeah. yeah, because they're using all the water in Lake Levon because they're not getting it from Texas. Yeah, but right. they've also drained down Chaplin so far that it's for the same reason. That's what I'm talking about. There is a problem. Nobody's denying it. There's Chaplin's in Dallas. Chaplin's in North Texas. Chaplin's in North Texas. What? They can take over the water. Zebra lines. Yeah. Just two thoughts for you. One is that, uh, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm correct. Um, we, it's surprising how well citizens in Louisville have responded to voluntary measures. Don't disagree that. And, and and secondly, I don't disagree with the voluntary deal. But when it comes out that you're in level one, people in Louisville are going to say, well, okay, it's voluntary. But but in Dallas, it's not voluntary. In Irving, it may be something else. In, in uh, Plano, it's a whole different deal. Because, because of the uh, the North Texas municipal. Here's the flip side of that coin is you force us into lockstep with Dallas. Dallas uh, controls the water. That, Dallas does control the water, but we can set our state. You put us in lockstep with Dallas and stop and think. Dallas uh, average uh, per capita usage is much higher than ours. Mainly because we, we don't use them. as much water. I, I don't disagree. But we're all in the same boat. Okay. Uh, here's we got an issue. We're in the shallow end of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> when they cut it off, we're out. Okay. We can do like Clyro Man did a few years ago. Their solution was to double the amount of water going through the lines. The other thing you kind of have to keep in mind uh, on that is having the stages is one thing, enforcing the stages is another. And especially when you get into mandatory uh, requirements, that certainly implies a level of enforcement, but that level of enforcement can vary dramatically. It's not spelled out in any of the plans or in any of the cities. So uh, that's one of those areas that you want to have some degree of control over, and you don't necessarily want to do everything that everybody else is doing. Well, you're going to have somebody that's not going to do anything. But they're in this, you know, they're using, they keep their same consumption up. Everybody else is trying to do something because the, the, the total good that comes out of a voluntary program or a mandatory program, the one city says nothing. Ideally, everybody would have the same day <coughs> consumption. Everybody would have the same water conservation and water management policies. Everybody would have the same drought emergency management policies. It's just there's a lot of variables. Maybe two, what adds to it is what was about five years ago when we had this problem last I think it was. I believe it was about five, six years ago when Plano, well, cities round up, Island Village, Bar Mound, Plano, McKinney, Frisco all went to big uh, mandatory water restrictions. We never did. The reason was because Dallas didn't like reason. We're tied to Dallas, they didn't. But their problem, if I remember correctly, was back to you told me what the problem was. Their distribution system was not could not keep up with the demand. It wasn't a supply problem back then. It was a distribution well, problem. Both that and, and the fact that they might have had uh, gallon per capita consumption levels of 220, 230 gallon 
gallons a day, where ours was already 160, 165. Right, yeah, they come it's like when they get down to 165, then we're on an even scale. So right. until they get down there, why do we need to you know, force the same measures on our citizens? So but, and, right, and, and what I was saying was, though, with the distribution level, they were having problems getting the distribution of the water. They had the water, but they couldn't get, keep it distributed and keep their tanks full. We, as Mr. Bax pointed out earlier, they had to that. In the first part of your deal, our distribution system, we still got seven, well, was it nine? 38, yeah, about nine. About nine MDD we can do with our display, I mean, our distribution system. We can do that much additional. It's just the supply now that's what's causing the problem. And to answer Councilman Durham's question about what happens in Dallas goes to the next day, but I mean, it was increased more. But what happens is they begin restricting their commercial uh, down to volume usage. Uh, actually, businesses can be reduced on the amount of water they use. And, and I don't know that they've ever pulled that trigger to stage three in their case and how that affects bottling companies, people that use water. I do not know how that's going to be, how they work that way. So, uh, if and when the zebra mussels make it into Lake Louisville, aside from getting tasty yeah. seafood straight from the tap, um, what what happens? I, I know it destroys kill our, our water plant or can tear it up. I know it wipes out sport fishing. You kill them before you get there. And that, that is through basically chlorine. It's chlorine injection and then a removal. That's pretty much what happened with uh, North Texas. They had a method to take care of it. They opted not to do it. And so they contaminated the light. So they can clean the system up. And they're building one right now. They're building what they're building these hotline right now so that they can take the water from Texas, chlorinate it, kill the organism, kill the, the muscles, and then put it in the system. Okay. So it is a it is a treatable process, but the problem is once you get it in the lake, how do you chlorinate it? I was going to say, we're going to see the with boats with those chlor taps, throw them out. So that's, it's a little problem. You don't that's the it. other issue. The core is, there was a deal yesterday, they were talking about mandatory wash stations for every boat that comes out at every uh, place the boat can come in or out. And they would be mandatory wash and there would be a fee to it and all that. Our shutting the lakes down was core wants to do There are those there are those places in Arkansas and Oklahoma that already have those stations. They warn you not to, to step out of the river without washing the boots or even the boats and everything else. Yeah. We pre our water once it gets in our pipeline before it comes to our plant. Right. We pre chlorinate it before it And watch but, the TV stations on those. And, and they, that's where they get their news. They don't get it from the local paper. They don't they even throw, throw it in my neighborhood. I get it. They hear Plano's doing this, and Irving's doing that, and Dallas is doing so and so. And the conclusion is every city is running its own show. But but they're not. That's my whole deal. Right. They're not running their whole show. Let's, We're getting water from Dallas. But let's just go. Yeah, let's kind of move on. Okay. Current, continue on current status. Again, yeah, lake levels are dropping as we go to business now that I've got the PC. However, understanding that this is this is a timely issue to try and reduce our concentration gallons per capita per day on the conservation level. But uh, again, we were full this time last year going into a drought and uh, we dropped six or eight feet in the lake. So it can happen again this summer. And Weather forecasters are predicting that this drought will continue, even though we did get a, a good, nice rain uh, several weeks ago. We did reach our subscribe capacity. I, I need to explain this. We have 20 million gallons of capacity at the water treatment plant. We have 34 million gallons uh, of treated water that we subscribe to, or that we, we have the ability to use. We purchased that product years and years ago. We 
very low cost. But we only pay for what we use, okay? So we have this amount of water, but we're only using 9 million gallons of treated water. So without increasing that 9 million gallons to 10 million gallons, that's where I'm saying we reach that capacity. We pump 9 from the treated water side, and we pump 20 from the plants. We have 29 million gallons, and that's what we have today. We have more water to go up. But again, that is where it costs when you go up on tree water, it's two hundred thousand gallons or two hundred thousand dollars per MPD. And Steve says we pay for what we use because that's our policy. Um, if you were to get into a situation where you had to bump your treated water up from nine to twenty nine in one summer, it might be very difficult to use or to pay or to use what pay for what we use. We 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 could basically be escalating our demand charge at the point where we couldn't get that much water. We couldn't get that much water out to the customer base. They, didn't, they don't need that much water in the winter. So we'd be paying for water that we don't use. So what is challenge, and Carol's challenge is always to maximize the current demand from the treated water side at whatever threshold we've hit in the past. And that's that number nine today. We'll probably go up to 10 next year would be my guess. And throughout the year, use that nine routinely, every single day, they use that nine. And then anything more they need, they get from the plant. And then next year, if we have to go to 10, then we'll use that 10 every day. Get whatever else we get from the plant. But what you don't want to do, and this is why irrigation control is so important, is to be forced into a situation where you have to go from nine to some bigger number that you then can't use during the rest of the year. You don't have you don't have the population to cover that on a normal basis. So again, without irrigation reduction, additional treated water will be required. It's not if, it's will be when we can't control it. Dallas and other area cities, again, are mandatory restrictions to reduce consumption. We must follow the Dallas restrictions of the previous convention. And uh, again, kind of weird, but we, we do remain in stage one on the voluntary just because of where we are on the use. Our consumption, uh, again, is less and it allows to stay during all the peak periods. Once I get into that peak period, Dallas is going to ask me to pull up to a mandatory state. Uh, voluntary requests, again, these are what we do today on voluntary. Educate, notify the customers through all of our communication tools, and basically, the uh, most common thing, watch your water leak, watch your water use, and control your irrigation on your uh, garbage collection days only and not on Sunday. By doing that, during the summer months, we were able to meet our peak goals. If we were to take a position to add a element to the education part as far as, uh, you know, things you do in the house, would it take some of the pressure off of this outside irrigation issue? My personal opinion, no. I mean, we, we educate, we, we have brochures out that says, you know, it's kind of it's minor items. Do not leave the water on while you're brushing your teeth. Do not, you know, leave your shower running if you're not in the shower. Do not wash, you know, dishes and clothes without full load. Those kind of things. The They're using water conservation devices. The irrigation demand is so substantial during the peak of the summer. It's, it's literally twice normal demand. So you can do all kinds of stuff for that normal demand that's not going to approach um, what we use for irrigation. That's the problem. That's uh, 200 million that's per day. That 200,000, if we bump it up, it's 200,000 per day. Per yeah. million. No, so per that's, that's, that's an annual. That's an annual. These are some suggested reductions. What we just talked about there. Uh, pool drain. We tried to eliminate during the during the summer months and, and then refilling. Most pool most pool owners do not do that. They'll add what they need. Evaporation, etc. Uh, uh, prevention of uh, runoff. Uh, and this is not runoff to you know from storm water. This is from irrigation that's running across the sidewalk as you mentioned a few moments ago. And then 
also a production, major issue of landscape water. City use, uh, we try to do, and that is we, we have reduced street washing in the past, and mainly a budgetary issue on the uh, general fund side, controlling our costs, but uh, street washing does not consume a lot of water, but it does have some vehicle washing. Uh, if we go into the next stages, we will enforce that, but most of the time we still out we want our vehicles looking good during stage one. Again, all this stuff is voluntary, it's all kind of feel good. It's, it's controlled things to some extent, but uh, not to any great extent, let's put it that way. We didn't cut off our own mill bounce, the bounce still run out in front of city. How much does that do? It's all recirculation, dude. It's recirculated, yes. All of our all of those things. A lot of it's again you're gonna have what's good for the use is good for the money. So stage two comes along. Now stage two, next slide. Stage two, those items that were suggested, recommended, good ideas, now become mandatory. Bounds are shut off. The irrigation requirements for residential, commercial, golf courses, and nurseries uh, are now mandatory. And they have certain days that they are able to uh, irrigate. For example, nurseries, uh, nursery stock, there's certain days and time limits. There are time limits listed when you can irrigate. And then we have our enforcement programs with uh, folks from PD and public service that will go to vehicle washing prohibited except for commercial car washes. All right, so stage three. Oh, I'm sorry. So the golf course is not excluded? The golf course, if they were using that water, this is just the way our ordinance reads. They use lake water. That's right. And Dallas and Stage 2, I believe, has already notified the golf courses that they have to reduce their water because they're in Stage 2 and they buy water. So that's separate contract. It's a separate contract. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. 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 right So we have several motions. They'll be affected. Right. Right. Vehicle one, this is stage three. Everything that was in stage two is now goes to the next degree of enforcement. And it's really an enforcement issue. We prohibit washing except for commercial car washes. Now we reduce to specific days that you can get your car washed. And it's either a Wednesday, Friday, or Wednesday, Wednesday Friday from the, from the time in the morning to the time in the hour of the afternoon it shuts down. Commercial users reduce consumption by a specified amount. This, uh, Carol would look at what she needs to meet the goals and, and get the requirements that we would need. We would bring that back to Mr. King and then present that to you for a percentage decrease in commercial use. Uh, that could be for not only uh, irrigation, but a total water consumption reduction or percentage reduction. All of them. And then all landscape water is prohibited for nursery plant stock and golf courses. Again, this doesn't apply to our golf courses. But nursery stock, new plantings uh, have a specific time and date, and then those are actually reduced from uh, stage two. So we don't have a, a step between two and three as far as uh, landscape watering, or for example, stage two, I believe, is two days a week on your days So then if you go to stage three, it, it, you don't have a step break, you go to one day a week. No, stage three is just no water. No water. Okay. And if we have new new structures, if we have uh, new buildings, very issued building permits, there will be exemptions there where they will not be required to put landscape in until after uh, the, we get out of the restrictions. So there are, there are some adjustments there. Right, so there. this is the stage right here <clears throat> that we anticipate that uh, will be required by our contract with Dallas to go to sometime this spring. Uh, this gets into the mandatory enforcement, theoretically, of those watering restrictions on C residential. And so people are supposed to water only on their trash day only during the hours prescribed by the stage. The 
the problem is always that third bullet, enforcement of restrictions. How far do we go in enforcing that? Under the ordinance, we can issue tickets. We can try to find some of the we think is responsible for doing that. Catch them when they come out and turn their water on or whatever, and stop them on the front lawn and hand them a pink slip. Uh, historically, I don't recall having ever done that. Maybe we did a little of it one time, but I don't recall much. We've done warning citations. We've done warning citations. Which we'll do again, and we'll always start with that. Uh, but there's a lot of issues associated with that, not the least of which is who's going to do it. I don't need the police department running around doing that. Um, the public services staff is busy doing their regular business. Eric's staff are busy doing their regular business. And so enforcement becomes a bit of a sticky widget. And so that's just FYI from, from your standpoint. Um, this is not anything that we would uh, have a major crackdown on. We probably gradually ramp up and gradually do more and more and more of it as we as we needed to, and there's going to be inconsistencies. Some guy's going to say, well, what about that guy down the street? I saw him water, and there'll be all that kind of stuff that goes on uh, when, you, when you try to enforce it to, uh, on anybody. So, again, that's just educational on your part, because it's, uh, it's one of the tougher things that we're exposed to in this more management plan. And as far as the restrictions, I'll make you aware that there are more details in the ordinance. I just picked out the few that, that highlight the most expensive uh, issues. So there are issues when you can irrigate your foundation or use a sucker hose on the foundation, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of that in the ordinance. In the ordinance. In the ordinance. We talked about how this would work. Carol would call Mr. King and uh, he would issue the order. Make public announcements through all types of different medias. And uh, for your information, there is there are variances in special needs authorization by administration. If there's a particular issue that's there, Mr. King has that ability under the ordinance to grant those variances. Duration of the emergency, the initial emergency stage is up to 60 days. Mr. King implements. We must bring that back if we wish to extend that for your approval as council. And again, as Mr. King indicated, uh, enforcement is, is one issue. We hope that the citizens comply. We work the uh, warning citations first, actually verbal warnings first, then a written citation, and then move there. And how we implement that, you know, we've got 26 square miles of populated area that we would have to try to monitor and enforce. We I, end up, if we end up having to do this, if we have minutes left on our code red. If we hadn't we got to do most of the screening red, you, it, I think it might be a benefit for us to use the code red to notify all of our citizens and give them a quick, I mean, it might be quick, but the quick details, that makes it we're doing this to call house mandate our supplier of uh, most of our water house mandate to go to this and blah, blah, blah. And that red cable. Right, I knew we do the cable. Social cable. media, yeah, we'll, we'll use it all. Oh, the cable. Can that go with the files too? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. And the file. They uh, the fines are five hundred dollars, not more than five hundred dollars for each offense. Each offense is uh, per day. And there's a new offense after each day. If the person wants to continue, he's off. He is a. Uh, 